What is going on everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the MI Gardener channel. I am so excited for today's video because we're gonna be talking about something that comes up so frequently on our channel. And that is, Luke, how did you end up settling on the gardening methods that you use today? And how did you know kind of when you were done, uh, when you were done experimenting with new methods and, and how do you know that you've really settled on something that you wanna continue going on, uh, that you wanna continue with uh, for you know, the remainder of your gardening hobby or career or journey. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today because we have a lot of different gardening methods that we implement in our garden and they didn't all just come about at once. You know, we've uh, slowly amassed a lot of these different gardening methods to create what we kind of consider to be our gold standard of gardening method. And it's, like I said, it's a compilation of a lot of different methods that we've discovered over the years. Nothing is really we didn't really discover everything all at once. And so um, I wanted to touch on that. And the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, is I wanted to talk, uh, just talk to you about not starting a garden at all because you're worried about picking the wrong method. You see, we get this question so often and that's, Luke, how do I know I'm picking the right method? Or what if I'm picking the wrong method? I'm concerned and I'm worried to start a garden because what if I fail when I pick the wrong method? And to that I would say, if you're someone that is thinking in that, in that mindset, you're looking at it all wrong. And don't take that the wrong way, because I was the same way when I first started gardening. You open up you know, 10 different gardening books and you try to become a sponge and you try to absorb that information, but what you find is that it becomes so overwhelming that you worry and you, 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 uh, you overthink rather than just start. And that's really what I wanna encourage you all to do is, you know, obviously, take these first two years, three years of your gardening uh, journey and use them for experimentation. Use them to see what works and what doesn't and adapt and, and modify to, till you find what you consider your gold standard because I can sit here all day, every day and when I have for many years, almost 10 years now, I've, I've sat in the garden, I've talked about what works for me and it seems like time and time again, we'll get people that say, Luke, I'm applying what you're doing, but I'm not getting the results that I'm looking for. And I'm really, I'm just wondering what I'm doing wrong. I'm wondering, uh, is it me or is it that your information isn't working for me? And to be honest, I hate to say it, but it's probably the latter. My information just isn't working for you. It's working for me, but gardening is not a one size fits all solution. If you're, if you're living in a warmer climate or colder climate, if you have different soil types, if you, you know, there's so many variables. And so those variables play into your results that you're going to have in your garden. And so I just want to encourage you guys to, uh, to use your experiences to shape and mold your uh, kind of gold standard of gardening. And obviously I'm here to give you guys inspiration. I'm here to you know, tell you what's working for me because they should in theory work for most gardeners, but they won't work for all gardeners. And so that's where you have to get in and kind of tweak and modify. So the first method that we've been implementing probably the longest on this channel have been raised beds. Now raised beds I consider to be a gardening method because you can grow in ground or you can grow in raised beds. And so this is a method of gardening that we've implemented and I wanna explain why this works so well for us. So for a couple of reasons. One, we found that in-ground gardening was very difficult to manage weeds as well as soil compaction. You know, when it came to walking on the ground uh, over the course of a whole season, we found that the soil got very compacted and we had to till and row to till and, and, and uh, flip the soil very regularly. And if we did that, it would disturb the soil, uh, the soil structure. It would upset worms as well as soil bacteria. And we wanted to find a way that was less intrusive, less invasive to kind of the, the way that nature would naturally have soil built and maintained. And so uh, through, I guess, through some, uh, through some different experimentations, we found that it was, at first we tried growing in mounds. You know, we didn't use any uh, actual boards uh, like, like I'm sitting on. We didn't use any boards at all to contain the soil. We just built mounds. And that was okay, but it still led to compaction in the pathways. And it still led to a lot of weeds that built up that we then had to mulch. And we found out, well, if we're already mulching, you know, we have to go back and then uh, rototill and flip uh, anyways. So now the mulch is getting mixed in with the soil. It's not a very good, uh, it's not a very good recipe for, for long-term sustainability. And it's not uh, a really great approach to, to having a nice clean garden and, and uh, one, that, one that doesn't require more work at the end of the season. You know, we wanted a garden that worked for us, not us work for it. 
And so we found that you know, even though the mounds were working, we needed something even a little bit better than that, a little, little more robust. And so that's where we came to using uh, two by 12s. And two by 12s gave us enough deep soil that the roots can travel out th throughout the soil. We can fill them with the soil that we choose. So we chose compost. It contains the compost inside of the, uh, the raised bed. We don't have to walk on it. We don't have to till it. We don't have to compact it. And what we can do is we can actually put our plants far closer together so that we can actually grow more food in less space. Also, it was a lot less to water. You know, when you're, when you're watering in ground, a lot of the water has a tendency to, to run away from the plants. It just has a tendency to, to flow away. But when you have really, uh, really fertile soil that's very porous, it holds onto water very well like a sponge, when you water, the water stays right there. What we found is that in mounds, well, without mounds at all, it just ran everywhere. Then with mounds, it almost made things worse because the water, it, since everything was mounded up, there was nothing to really contain the water inside of the area we were trying to grow in. The water just sloughed off and carried with it lots of nutrients and soil. And then the soil got into the walkways, which then led to weeds and the plants dried out in the mounds because they weren't really adequately uh, they weren't really adequately getting the water that they needed. So let's go to the next gardening method, which is core gardening. So core gardening is a type of gardening method that we've actually implemented in combination with raised bed gardening. Now core gardening utilizes straw bales. And in, uh, in the fall, we'll actually go by and we'll pick up big straw bales, we'll let them rot over the winter, and then in the spring, we'll bury them before we plant our garden. And we bury them about 10 inches deep or so, about uh, in a trench that's about 12 in, 10, 12 inches wide by about eight, 10 inches deep. We'll layer the straw in there. We'll bury it over with, with, fresh, uh, with fresh compost. And then we plant right on top of it. And what that does is it actually uh, absorbs water throughout the growing season and holds it in there as a water reservoir. The rotted straw actually holds onto it like a sponge, which then breaks down, feeds the plants, but also adds uh, that, that rich water source that your plants can tap into throughout the growing season. And that's one of the main reasons why even this year, as dry as it's been, we've had to, supplemental, we've had to supplementally water a lot less than we would normally. And these tomatoes here, and all the other crops for that matter, are really loving it because uh, they, don't have to be, they don't have to be watered on a regular basis, which actually stresses them out when it's very hot. And so the reason why we came across this method was because you know, we liked how raised beds were, were growing for us, but there was a few downsides. One of them was that we still had to water more than we wanted. In you know, the middle of summer, the last thing I wanna do when it's 95 degrees is come out and water. Watering very frequently, like I said, stresses out your plants, it has a higher chance of, of burning the root systems, of uh, you know, just stressing out the plants and, and causing a lot of um, negative side effects and things like that. It also, uh, you know, when, you, when you have to water very frequently, it takes a lot of water, which is very expensive in the area that I live in. Water is extremely expensive, and, so, uh, and, and it's, I know it's expensive for a lot of you as well. And so water was very expensive. So not only did it take a lot of time, but it was very expensive. And so I wanted a way to cut cost as well. Watering very frequently also led to a lot of weeds. And even in raised beds, we found that uh, weeds would grow up very quickly because we were watering so frequently that those little shallow surface weeds, they would have a lot of access to water because we were watering all the time. So we discovered this core gardening method um, through a, uh, th there was a, I was taking the Master Gardener's course and there was a book that we were reading and just there was this brief notation about how, uh, about how the, um, the tribe, uh, the tribal, uh, yeah, the tribal groups in the sub-Saharan regions of Africa were using grass as a as a method of uh, water reservoir in their soil, and so the uh, Aborigine is the term that I was using. Um, so these Aborigine tribes were uh, using uh, they were using um, Sahara grass to uh, grow in, and they were using it as a core, almost like Hugo culture. And, uh, and I said, well, okay, if it's, if it's bone dry there and it's working for them, what could it do for us? And so what I found through that is that I had to water less. I had a lot less weeds because I had to water less. So all those shallow surface weeds, they didn't sprout. They actually kind of uh, smothered themselves out because it got so dry that that top one to two inches stayed dry, even though there was water deep down in the soil. And so that just worked for me. And it made a whole lot of sense because I figured, okay, I have to work less, I have to water less, it costs me less, it feeds my plants over time, it builds organic matter, 
it seems like a win-win situation. And it really was, it worked out so well for me that we kept on implementing it. And that's a method, that's kind of a mainstay gardening method that we use in our garden. And it's actually one of the main gardening methods that I really touch on in my, in my uh, book, The Autopilot Garden. If you've not yet checked out that book, I'd recommend checking it out. We have it over on Amazon as well as our website. Um, I'd recommend getting it from our website because it helps support the show more. But uh, get it wherever you want. And uh, it's a great book that touches on all these different gardening methods that I'm gonna touch on today. My goodness, look what happens when you forget to come out and harvest for a day or two. Gee, many critters. Well, these are compost cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where they're going to go. So uh, the, uh, the next gardening method that we are going to touch on that we really have loved is high intensity spacing. Now high intensity spacing is a type of spacing that we've chosen because of uh, just how much we can grow in such a little space. You know, with our, with our bed right here as an example, we have cucumbers growing vertically. We have, uh, we have a whole, well, a half a bed of potatoes. And then past that, we have another half a bed of zucchini and they're spaced so closely together that there's really no room for weeds to grow up. There's no room for other forms of competition. And what we've done is we've grown them in a, in a very uh, fertile soil, very rich in compost, and that allows us to grow closer together because there's less competition for water because the, the compost holds onto water uh, better. We also have the cores in place, which holds onto water much better. And we also have the raised beds, which holds the fertility in real close so we can grow much closer together. Also, because the soil doesn't compact, there's a lot less uh, room for, for uh, roots to compete for space. So that helps us in a way. And all of those things allow us to space our plants much closer together. So much closer that they actually shade out the soil as a natural living mulch. And when you do that, what you find is that uh, not only are you growing just as much food, but you have to work a whole lot less. One, high intensity spacing helps to shade out the soil to smother out weeds. High intensity spacing also helps you to water less because the soil is actually being covered. So things like evaporation don't happen as fast. And then the final thing that it really does is it, uh, like I said, it allows us to grow more food in less space. And for me, that was the billing, that was the biggest selling point for me is that I could grow two or three times as much produce in half the space. I mean, that's incredible. Growing four times, six times as much produce as you would normally just was, was kind of a no brainer for me. And it was based off of, I was spacing out my crops based on the traditional recommended garden spacing. Now that is uh, kind of the, the, on the back of every seed packet or on the back of every plant tag, it'll tell you how far you should be spacing these plants apart. And what that's, what that's based on, unfortunately, is the large scale farming model. And in a large scale farming model, you have big tractors and farming implements that have big wheels and lots of things that you gotta move around that are big and bulky. And you, you don't have as much luxury to, to space your plants really closely together because you've gotta, you know, your, your tractors and whatnot have to get through the rows so you can maintain large swaths of land. But in a garden, you're only maintaining, you know, 20, 30, 40 square feet at a time per bed. And it allows you to grow so much more uh, closely together because you don't have those big farming implements and things. And so uh, because of that, it really has led a lot of gardeners to space their plants out too far. And when they do that, it opens up the soil to weeds, which we found was a big problem starting out gardening. It also opens up the soil to soil degradation. When the sun beats down on the soil, it, uh, it actually solarizes, which means that it actually will radiate and kill a lot of the beneficial bacteria and fungi that are found in the soil that actually help you grow a better garden. They interact with plant roots and help you to obtain nutrients that are locked in the soil. It also helps your plants to uh, be more drought resistant. It also helps them to be more disease resistant and pest resistant. So that natural ecology that happens in the soil is so vital and the sun just like you get a sunburn, can basically burn the soil and cause it to be void of life. Now, another obvious but noteworthy gardening method that we've chosen is organic gardening. Now there is inorganic, which is using like synthetic fertilizers, uh, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, and things like that. And then there's organic, which is basically using only things found that are organic compounds that would be created naturally. 
Now, this is an obvious one for me because, but I, I didn't start out growing organically. I actually started out using things like miracle Grow. I used uh, Seven Spray. I, I mean, I use all the all of the chemicals that are uh, commercially available at your local big box store because I thought that they would make gardening easier for me. But what I found is I actually worked harder and spent more money trying to grow inorganically. And that's because as soon as I fostered an environment that, uh, that was more natural, everything actually started falling into place far easier and started working for me rather than me working for my garden. I not only had to work less, but I also spent a lot less. You know, with things like uh, pesticides, I would go out and get seven spray and I'd spray my plants down. Well, when I did that, I would actually kill a lot of the good bugs, the beneficial insects, not only in the soil, but on my plants. And that then opened up a whole new, uh, you know, there was a, there was a imbalance where I would kill off all the insects in my garden and that would leave room for more negative, uh, more bad bugs to come in. And there wasn't the, the balance. There was not that healthy balance of predator and prey where say things like aphids would come in and uh, ladybugs would come in to eat the aphids. Well, if I killed the, the ladybugs and the aphids, it was just a Band-Aid on a, on, a, on a problem. It didn't really actually solve the issue. And then more aphids would come in, but there was no, there was very little or no uh, ladybugs to control the aphids. So then the problem would just balloon and I'd be so reliant on those, on those sprays. Also, conversely with using things like, using things like, uh, um, your, your fertilizers, your synthetic fertilizers like miracle Grow, I found that my soil was so reliant on them because I was not being forced to build the soil. My soil was actually be, uh, being uh, bogged down with things like heavy salts. You know, salts, not table salt, but salts, which is, um, it's, a, it's basically like a crystalline substance that is formed from synthetic fertilizers. And what it does is it builds up in your soil and it actually can kill soil life like bacteria and fungi. It can actually void the plants, uh, it can actually prohibit the plant's ability to uptake nutrients and uh, to properly uh, you know, grow in the soil because uh, the root systems are not being encouraged to go throughout the soil and find the nutrients. You're just giving them right at the plant. Uh, and then over time that builds up and it actually, again, causes you to be very reliant where your plant will wilt, you'll give it fertilizer, it'll perk up, it'll wilt, you'll give it fertilizer, it'll perk up, and it's, you're not encouraging that natural growth. And me, all the while, you're only harming your soil and you're only, like I said, building up those harmful salts and things like that that, uh, that build up in your soil and kill the natural ecology that we so look for in an organic garden. And so it just really created this, this, uh, this model of dependency that I just didn't like. I didn't like having to go to the store for every little thing. I thought, well, okay, the stores are here today, but what if, what if something happens where there's a shortage or what happens if I can't get this at the store anymore or what happens if I can't even get to the store? I want to know how to grow my food naturally. And it was just through this, this, this seeking for easier and, and better and cheaper alternatives that I came across organic gardening and it ultimately led me to by far the best way to garden and in a way that I can uh, grow food not only uh, the same quality but better quality. Um, my food is uh, it, it's so much sweeter, it's so much uh, healthier. The, the fruit is just as big. The fruit is just as big as it would normally be. I mean, take for instance, look at this. Look at these. Look at these Basia bahio peppers. These things are gigantic. They're absolutely huge. And we grow massive tomatoes and peppers and uh, cantaloupes and pumpkins and you name it. Beautiful crops, all organically. You don't need synthetic fertilizers to do that. It's a very common misconception that you need uh, synthetic fertilizers to grow big crops. When in fact, all it does is create dependency. And all it does is suck money from you and time from you where you're constantly having to babysit and constantly having to feed your garden because you're not actually giving your garden what it needs in a sustainable way. Now the last and final gardening method that I really wanted to touch on is biodiversity. Now biodiversity or polyculture is a gardening method that we've adopted and one that's really worked best for us because it allows us to grow so many different types of crops in our small little garden. I know when I first started out gardening, I wanted to grow you know, one type of tomato. I wanted to grow one type of corn. I wanted to grow something that I knew would grow well for me, but that I could grow a lot of. And I wasn't really focused on all the different unique varieties that are out there. I just wanted to create production. And what I found through polyculture or biodiversity is that 
you get to have so much more of a robust culture of your garden. You know, when it comes to tomatoes, there are thousands of different varieties of tomatoes. Each one has a different uh, growth habit. Some are smaller, some are bigger, some are bushier, some are more vining. Some are bigger fruits, some are smaller fruits, and some are different colors. And having those different, uh, those different varieties allow you to really experience all of the different amazing varieties that are out there, except just, you know, other than just one. Another thing that it helps you do is it helps you to have better success in your garden. What I found is that, you know, even though I'm growing on a small home scale, when I would grow just one type of vegetable, that one type of vegetable might have an issue. It might be blight or it might be, you know, powdery mildew, something like that. And it wipes out the entire crop. Well, when you're working with biodiversity, you're, you're growing in a polyculture and you're encouraging lots of different varieties of the same type of, of crop, um, with things like tomatoes, you know, one crop might be more blight resistant. One crop might be more uh, resistant to powdery mildew. And having those, having that diversity gives you some insurance so that if something does go wrong, it actually helps you to, uh, to have kind of a backup. And so that really was a big help for me because I would have so many years where I'd lose a crop and I'd say, well, it's just not going to be a tomato year. But in years, uh, you know, in years after that, when I started to diversify, I found that instead of saying, well, tomato's not a, you know, this year's not a tomato year, I would instead be saying, well, I have an abundance of tomatoes. I'm just not getting Rutgers. It's just not a Rutgers year. And so that was so much more reassuring that I could still grow what I wanted to grow, just not everything, because not everything always happens perfectly. And then the final thing that biodiversity allowed me to do was it actually allowed me to grow uh, with organics. Obviously, it allowed me to have more of a sustainable ecosystem. You know, with this sunflower here, so, uh, you know, one sunflower, one type of sunflower is wonderful. But if I grow multiple different types of sunflowers, they're blooming at different times of the year. And that means all these beautiful pollinators, all of the beneficial insects, they're coming uh, to my plants at different times because they're in flower at different times. Not everything is just blooming all at once and then done. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I really hope that you learned something new. I know it was longer, but I do really want to, I really wanted to get all these gardening methods out there. And I wanted to help all of you that had questions on, you know, Luke, why'd you pick the gardening methods that you picked? And uh, I wanted to answer that. And we do still have a lot of other small gardening methods here and there that we've picked over time, but uh, there are just so many that I can't really fit into one episode. And I touched on the main ones, the big ones. And so I hope you guys, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure to throw a like up there and also make sure to share this video with a friend if you did enjoy, because I'm sure they would enjoy it as well. And if you've not yet subscribed, make sure to do that because we have lots more content coming out. And I absolutely love seeing how fast this community has grown and, uh, and just see where we're going as a community. And, uh, and the amazing things that we're doing. So as always, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned something new. And this is Luke from the MI Gardener channel reminding you to grow big or go home. We'll catch you all later. See ya.